welcome everyone to, I think it's the ninth or tenth in our series of webinars. And what we try to do is take a subject that is to do with curl use, but not restricted to curl use, and look at it and get some experts in to thrash it around, get some contrary views if we can. And then we find at the end, we've all moved our knowledge base on and they're in, they're in informative, but also hopefully they're quite subversive in that they help us become better activists in the long fight to save our nature. And we've called this one the value of the curlew, and we might as well have called it the economics of nature. And I remember when I, when I was researching a, a book I wrote on cattle, a grizzled old farmer saying to me, you tell me how much money you'll give me and I'll tell you how much welfare you can have. And in, to an extent, the same applies to nature. Everything has a price, so there are financial costs to the steps we make take to make it all better. And whilst we live in straightened financial times, we also live in a world where corporates are keener and keener to display their, their social credentials and, and, are, and indeed are having to do that. So this is becoming much more of a thing. Um, the system is not perfect, it's not fully developed. And it's not fully agreed. And actually this evening we should have two quite good, vaguely contrary views on the thing. Um, one of which is that the idea of extending the language of capital into nature is based on a fundamental misunderstanding of prosperity. So like all our debates, what we seek is courteous disagreement as the grit that from which the oyster of knowledge appears. I'm sorry about that. Um, I was actually involved in a head starting project when I was thinking about this this morning for Curlew last year. And it cost exactly £1,100 to get each of our 40 Curlews up in the air. So um, when the first one got eaten by a peregrine on day one, and the second one got eaten by a fox on night one, it kind of, you realise this is about money as well. But actually, I love that each time I see a Curlew now, I just think cheaper the price. Love it. Anyway. This is all sort of leading on really from the Das Gupta review in 2020, and I'm sure you've all you're all aware of it. And if you haven't read the executive summary, I urge you to do so because it is it's very good and it's it's sort of life changingly informative. And what he did was argue for a wholesale change in our economic model and to move on from using crude GDP as a measure of prosperity to doing something more refined. And that's really the background of our discussion this evening. To the layman, I think there's a number of challenges implicit in valuing natural capital, like, you know, it's easy to work out the cost of pollinating all the fruit trees if you've killed off all the pollinators, but less so to value the ecosystem service, say, the, the nutrient value of a mudflat. How do you value the enjoyment of nature and how can nature possibly go on a balance sheet? All these things have to get thought about and talked about. Um, but don't worry about any of this, and I don't have to worry about any of this, because we've got three great panellists this evening who are going to demystify it and lead our chat. First of all, David Hill, many of you will know, he's chairman and the founding owner of the Environment Bank, which he set up in 2006 to introduce the concept of compensation yeah. via biodiversity offsetting, net gain and habitat banking, which now leads the way in de deploying private investment into private land holdings to achieve nature recovery at scale. He's got a lifetime of experience in conservation with senior positions in Natural England and the government's Ecosystems Markets Task Force. He's also a trustee of the Esme Fairbairn Foundation and of Plant Life. He is a massive friend of the Curly. You only have to um, Google him to see that. And he will lead us through the joys of corporate sector nature positive. John O'Neill is a philosopher and he's the Professor of Political Economy at the University of Manchester, having held senior posts at Lancaster, Sussex and the University of Wales, and is a member of the Society and Environment Research Group and the Centre for Democracy and Elections. His interests cover, his wide interests cover political economy and philosophy, environmental policy and the philosophy of science. He also is a passionate Curlew lover, and he's here this evening, among all the other things, maybe to strike a cautionary note into this debate. Finally, Xanthi Caldicott, she is Managing Director and Co-Founder of Green the UK, and that's a business which connects companies with wildlife projects, 
helping to deliver projects on the ground from tree planting to the restoration of wildflower meadows, kelp forests and native oysters. She's got a background in both business and teaching and is keen that natural history teaching is something that businesses learn just as enthusiastically as school children. She'll be talking about what businesses are looking for in these projects and she completes the trio of curly lovers, which I love. Right, that's quite enough from me. David, can I ask you to get the ball rolling? Yeah, thank you, Roger. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll qualify my interest in curly. I think they're the most phenomenal bird, um, as I do about many birds, of course, because uh, I'm an ornithologist by training years and years ago. Um, and where I'm sitting now, we have a small farm in, um, in the Yorkshire Dale stroke Nidderdale, where we have up to 10 pairs of breeding curlew, which is, um, you know, a long time ago, that wouldn't have been very, very exciting, but it is really exciting now. Um, and we do all we can to try and see if we can get them to um, succeed and, and we have variable success, but they're a long, very, as we know, a very long lived bird, very site tenacious and have been effectively wrecked, uh, in my view, by intensive agriculture which has caused the damage. Um, and uh, so what I'm going to really focus on is why I think uh, we've got to make nature economically visible. If, I, if I'm really honest, I would prefer that we didn't, but I think that the business model of the NGO sector over the last 60 years has not been fantastic. Um, they've done as good a job as they can, but we're just left with fragments of value and we've had a farming system that really hasn't paid attention to ecosystem service um, importance. And if we throw into the mix that 55% of global GDP, uh, even though we recognise GDP is a pretty poor measure of, um, of, of success, progress or whatever you want to call it, 55% <clears throat> of global GDP relies on what nature provides. So actually, all over the last 60 years where we've seen a 60 percent, 70 years, we've seen 50 to 70 years, we've seen a, at least a 60 percent decline in biodiversity in the UK. Um, we've been we've done we've done that by subsidising the uh, those impacts on nature. So we've we've dis we've destroyed nature by not paying the true cost uh, uh, of it. And actually, the Des Gupta review was all well and good. But in fact, all of this really started back in 2008 with Pavan Sukhdev, and if you many of you will remember the um, the ecosystems of uh, he should have called it he should have called it the economics of nature, but he called it the e the economics of ecosystems and biodiversity or TEEB, and that was done under the previous Labour government. And actually, most of the hard work was really done there, in, in my view. And later on, uh, uh, the Das Gupta added to that, but the actual premise as to why we need to value nature uh, in economic terms uh, was really set out by um, by Teep. Uh, and you should go back and have a look at those. There's a lot of work still there that's very relevant today. Um, so in the Environment Bank, we our philosophy is that we have to make nature economically visible because the reason that, in my view, that biodiversity has collapsed is that it hasn't been factored into the true cost of the use of land. Um, and if that 55% of global GDP uh, <clears throat> comes home to roost by uh, future declines in biodiversity, we are going to be faced with a very, very, very serious situation for the economics of business. Um, so uh, I'm really passionate about making nature economically visible, irrespective of the fact that I would just love to do nature conservation for the sake of it. Let me get that right. But actually, that isn't going to pay for where we need to be in, in the future. So just a very quick piece about the Environment Bank. I'd spent 20 or more years working on environmental impact assessments for developments um, across the UK, well, and overseas, but largely in the UK for large projects as well as small projects. And by 20, 2006, got pretty fed up with the way that development was not paying true account for the biodiversity at all. There was no interest um, and there was no capacity in planning authorities to get biodiversity delivered uh, as part of development schemes. And in fact, actually, it's a pretty poor exercise because biodiversity within housing schemes um, isn't true biodiversity, in my view, despite what a few other people believe. But more and more people are realising that we've got to take 
the value of the impacts from development and put it into large scale habitat creation and long term management schemes. So that's what we're doing in the Environment Bank. And um, having, you know, sort of designed this concept of what we call biodiversity net gain that many of you will, will know, um, I, it took me 14 years, but we managed to get it into law in in November 2021, where developers have to deliver this minimum uplift in 10% biodiversity. So that background as to why I got involved and interested in environment, environmental markets. Um, and and so along alongside that, um, I realised I had to find investment now to properly do this at scale. And we've we managed to raise a fund of 220 million to put into habitat banking across England to start with. Um, and we're rolling out those habitat banks now as we speak, which is I, I just pinch myself every day thinking that how the hell, hell do we do that but we did it on the back of actually showing that nature is economically visible and that what i mean by that is that nature loss is a is it going to be a cost to us has been a cost to us if we understand it's a cost to us and um, it has a price and if it has a price it has a value so it's the cost price value piece that i think is really important to remember and where we've been pre in, in, in previous years, I think, is that we've all done conservation uh, under very small grant schemes, irrespective of the fact that I sit, I sit on, as a board of trustee on Esme Fairban, and we give about 12 to 15 million pounds a year into our natural world projects, which are nature based um, type projects. Irrespective of that, that, those grants are very, very small and have pretty small levels of impact on the ground. Um, and when you look at the economics of biodiversity, if you look at the 17 major uh, en environmental NGOs, uh, they have a, around a turnover of about a billion a year and something in the order of, say, 340, 350 million is spent on biodiversity in some shape or form. <clears throat> the problem with it is you can't disaggregate what is done on the ground to actually improve ecosystems and species recovery from simple salaries and pension funds, pension schemes. So um, there isn't 350 million being spent directly on biodiversity conservation from that sector. If you add then on to that, the agri-environment schemes that uh, are still present, that's probably another 380 million. So with a fair wind, we've got about 750 million uh, going into some form of nature conservation in, in, in this country. I'll say widely the UK now. Um, and then you look at the Green Finance Institute's calculations on what we require to actually turn the dial on biodiversity and nature recovery. And it's coming out at an average of £5.6 billion pounds a year with a range of, I think, is it 4.1 to 9.7, something of that order. So if you take the average of £5.6 billion gap, sorry, re requirement versus, say, £750 million that is available through current measures, in no way at all will we change the move the dial on biodiversity unless we get private investment into private land holding. That's what we've got to do. Um, so that's that's the sort of basis of the Environment Bank. So we're now moving into this corporate piece. So we're doing a lot of work with the development sector and setting up habitat banks from which they buy uh, what we call BNG credits or units to enable them to be compliant with uh, the new planning law and in the Environment Act 2021. But we're also doing the same for corporates on the basis of what, of what we think will be a major increase in the market uh, for these, if you like, biodiversity credits or whatever you want to call them. Um, and I have to make a distinction between what we're trying to do and perhaps what Xanth is trying to do. Um, we, we are not really focusing at all on corporate social responsibility. And forgive me, Zanthi, if I've not really understood in total, because I know I'll learn a lot from you later. But um, I think CSR is, can be a bit of a sop to make the corporates feel good about what they're doing for nature, but actually doesn't address the potential impacts through their supply chains. So in the advent of the Task Force for Nature Related Financial Disclosure, which is coming down the track, where it will be a requirement for corporates to mandate their um, to, to report on their impacts and hopefully uh, reduce them and then potentially offset re the residual impacts of their impacts on on that natural capital that I think will um, drive a market 
for some form of buying into land-based management schemes that restore nature at scale. Um, and I think that that's the market for that will be at least six times the scale of the market for BNG, and it will be recurring every year. And from that, I think there is a, a means of getting better finance into the likes of Curlew. Uh, it may need to be done at the level of the habitat restoration at scale, uh, and that's going to be a tall job uh, because it means changes to farming uh, on a significant scale too, which I think actually will happen. I think that is that is coming down the track as well. So um, I'll probably finish there. But I, what I would say, Roger, is and to everyone is that um, I probably feel more hopeful for biodiversity conservation now than I ever have in my career. Um, so I guess I'd wish I was 40, 40 years younger and starting out rather than coming towards the, the end of, of my career, because I think the opportunities will be vast. I think we can really do it, but we won't do it if we carry on under a system which is based on grants uh, and and people having a love for nature, because it will not appeal to the general population. Whereas a model that's based on making or realising that nature has an economic importance to us, I think really will make the difference. I'll probably stop there, if I may. Is that all right? Uh, that that is that is a very succinct and informative. Um, setting out um thank you so much david actually uh, it's really good to hear someone like you say that you're more hopeful about biodiversity now than you've ever been in your career because your career is a long one and i think you know people like us in our little uh, in our little charity are very very happy to hear that i would just throw in one supplementary question that gap of i think if my maths are right 4.8 billion between what is available and what is needed how many years is that going to take to bridge, do you think? Well, I think that the if the court if we can get the corporate sector on board with TNFD, so TNFD is ultra critically important. And I, I'm sure that the GFI, you know, the Green Finance Institute and and the guys that, that, that are running TNFD understand this. Uh, but I think that you'll be you'll be able to generate three to four billion pounds a year investment into natural capital on the basis of the corporate sector. Now, that's pretty much finger in the air. Um, you know, if you look at the if you look at the turnover, the aggregate turnover, say the FTSE 100 companies, then you take a percentage of that. It's minute. You're probably talking of 0.5 percent of the of the um, maximum of the of the of the those turnovers of those corporates, which would generate that sort of level. I think if my maths served me right a few months ago since I looked at this, but I think it's of that scale. So, you know, you'd be able to generate that per year. And that's what we need per year. It's 5.6 billion a year, certainly until 2030 to get this nature recovery. And so what I see at the moment is this huge amount of rhetoric around nature recovery, local nature recovery strategies, massive amounts of debate, talking. You know, I sit on, I chair the local nature partnership up in this neck of the woods. And um, we do a huge amount of talking, but, you know, Let's review where, what we're doing on the ground to make things happen. And I'd like to just see a lot more happening on the ground and probably a bit less talking about it, really, or at least telling people what, what we're doing. Um, yeah. Uh, a, a good answer. And I, I think the, the, that, that thing of um, less talk and more action is kind of an abiding theme throughout this thing. Um, John, um, the, the floor is now yours. Um, I think you've got a screen to share with us. And you've successfully shared it. Um, all right, so, off. all yours. Yeah. Okay, thanks ever so much. So, so I'm I'm in I'm here. I mean, I'm looking forward to this debate. I was saying to David before we all started that I've had a similar debate with Dieter Helm before and Tony Juniper. So, it's interesting to hear David's uh, take on it as well. And I'm looking forward to a good conversation with you all. So I'm I'm actually a critic of the Descriptor report and of uh, biodiversity banking, but I, I and offsets. But I'll start by saying a little bit about the curlew. So the reason why it's valuable to me, I was I was born up in a council estate in the north of London, and um, which didn't have many curlews in it, <laughs> right? But uh, talk of curlews was common in our council house, and the reason was my dad had been brought up in the really poor area of Barrow in the 1930s. And to escape the poverty, he'd gone into a hiring fair in Alberston and hired himself out at £10 for six months to local farms. 
and he worked in the in Cumbria in the Lim Valley. And he would talk about that. And one of the main things he would talk about was the hearing the call of the curlew. So I was brought up on a council estate with no curlews around, but with constant conversations about curlews. And so later, I now live in Lancaster and just down the Loom Valley. And the, the call of the curlews infused in my memory and the sight and sound of them as I walk in the Boland Fells behind us uh, here or on the mud banks of the Loon Estuary. It means a lot. But I wonder if that kind of meaning it has for me can be caught in the language of capital or natural or natural value or monetary valuation. And that's what I want to question, really. So increasingly, uh, I, I'll put this another way. I used to go for walks with my friends on the fells and with my family and we'd listen to curlews and so on and we'd, we'd talk about them. I've now discovered that actually I wasn't, I was actually walking through natural capital and what I was doing all in, all the time was improving my social capital. And what happens when social relations to family, friends and community are formed, you know, described as social capital or relations to the environment like moorlands or estuaries are described in terms of natural capital. So what I want to do here is say what it is to conceive of environmental goods like the habitat of a curlew as natural capital and then outline three critical responses. The first is you pervade, you're creating a perverse asset class and I'll say a bit about that. Secondly, I think it fails to capture the value of curlew for people's well-being in various ways. And thirdly, it's related to various forms of justice, both globally, injustice, both globally and at home. So that's the, 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 the three critical responses. So what is it to conceive of environmental good as a natural capital? I think there's four, I think there's actually five fifth claim I could add about financialization, but I'll stick with these four. First thing is that natural assets uh, should, that's like sites of biodiversity, should be understood as assets that provide benefit streams, ecosystem services for human well-being, provisioning services, regulating service, cultural services, supporting services. And then you have what uh, Dave is called uh, net gain policy or no net loss or if possible net gain. That the losses in one component of compatible of capital can be substituted and compensated by improvements in another. And, and as long as the services are maintained or improve well-being. The third is the monetization of natural capital. The claim is that it should be assigned a monetary value. And finally, you have offset markets, which uh, David's talked about and outlined. Uh, and they're seen as so you get marketization. So the most effective way and efficient way of achieving no net loss or net gain in natural capital is through the kind of offset markets that David's been involved in setting up through his environmental banking. So that's conceiving of environmental goods as natural capital. So I want to make three critical claims about that. The first one, I just and, I, and this matters here, and, it, and I think it it's and I'll come back to it right at the end, is that offset markets create a perverse asset class. So the economic value of an environmental good depends on the existence of environmental losses. So the the the, the, the economic value of a particular site of biodiversity, say the habitat of a curlew, as an offset is dependent on a loss of biodiversity elsewhere. Without that loss, it would be economically worthless. And what that does is it creates a structural dependence of nature conservation and nature conservation organizations on the existence of environmental losses and environmental damage. And I'll come back to how that, how, the kind of problems that raises at the end of my, of my uh, introduction. So the first thing to notice is, is you're creating this, you're coupling the value, the, the economic value of, uh, of of an environmental good with environmental damage. The second is claims about the fact that you can substitute a loss of biodiversity in one place by a gain somewhere else. So the core claim is we should treat biodiversity as uh, which should be value for the ecosystem service that they provide for human beings, and that losses in one component of capital can be substituted by gains in another, so long as the services they provide are maintained or improved. There's two kinds of objections that can be made to that. The first one is just about the intrinsic value of non-human nature. 
the curlew has value in itself, independent of its contribution to human well-being. And that's a standard line. So, so to think of natural and proponents of natural capital are aware of this. It doesn't claim to catch the in, capture the intrinsic value of non-human nature. The second, however, I seems to me is the value of non-human nature to human beings is also missed. It, it misses the way that places and habitats matter to us. And, I, and I'm not going to talk, we can talk later on about the intrinsic value of non-human nature or the intrinsic value of curlew, but I want to focus on this second one, that even if we're thinking about human well-being and us, we still are not capturing that value. So I'll turn to this notion of substitutability. How is one su uh, su site substitutable for another? And here I'm a philosopher, so I'm going to give you a few philosophical distinctions here. And the first one is a bit of Latin, is the de dicto and de re valuations. And that sounds really fancy, but the, the way I'm going to introduce it is with a really bad joke. So I really apologise for the joke in advance. And then I'm going to ruin that joke by explaining it. So here's, here's the bad joke. This is a Zaza Gabor. And this is a putative interview with her. And Zaza says, our people misunderstand me. They think I'm just a creature of leisure, that I do nothing useful. But they are wrong. I'm constantly finding new ways to do good for people. Interviewer, like what? Zaza, I have found a way of keeping my husband young and healthy almost forever. Interviewer, eternal youth, that's quite a discovery. How do you do it? Zaza, Zaza I get a new one every five years. So that's the bad joke. Right, here's now my bad, <laughs> my, my ruining of a bad joke. So the statement that Zaza Gabor values a husband who's young and healthy is ambiguous. What we expect is a day ray reading. Day ray means of the thing. We, we expect that she's valuing a particular person, her husband, and she values that he is young and healthy. Actually, what, what Zaza is assuming is a day dicto value, it's a day dicto reading. She, what is valued, who, whoever falls under the description of the husband of Zaza Gabor, that he is young and healthy. So de dicto means of, of what is said, of the description. So a de re valuation, you value a particular thing. De dicto valuation, what's valued is falls is whatever falls under a description. So value some so, so value some object or or being merely as a vehicle that provides services is to value it de dicto, not de re. Okay, if you look at net gain policy and the practice of a biodiversity offsetting, they assume these de dicto valuations. They they as long as sites meet certain descriptions of biodiversity properties, they're substitutable for each other. All we're concerned about, just as Zaza Gabor husbands are substitutable for each other, as long as they meet the description of being young and healthy. Now, that de dicto valuation is consistent with considerable limits to the substitution of one object with another. So the substitution must fall under the same description, the substitute must fall under the same description. And um, that then it becomes an issue about how you're describing it. So if you're thinking about one site being substituted by another, it is that might be possible under one description, for example, as a mixed woodland, but not under another, for example, a woodland that contains a, spe a specific uh, mix of species types. So if you think about the uh, Smithy Wood in, uh, in Sheffield that was going to be destroyed for a, a motorway uh, service station, you know, the developer said it's OK, we're going to create uh, a larger area of woodland that will offset that. But, the, the you know, one criticism <clears throat> is that the new, the new offset site didn't contain the same kind of biodiversity as the site that was being destroyed. Right, if, if you go on to a specific description. So much of the criticism of possibility of biodiversity offsetting quite properly is concerned about the ways in which equivalence of two sites of biodiversity is characterised. How do we characterise it? Is it just a mixed woodland or is it a very specific set of uh, species, uh, mix of species in that woodland? However, if, if you look at people who defend sites of biodiversity, they often value them de re. They value that particular place, and that places deeper restrictions on the possibility of substitution without loss. It's the particular object that's valued, not whatever object falls under description. And if a site of biodiversity is valued day rate, it can't be substituted without loss 
simply because it falls under the same description. So why value day, day ray? When, when is day, day ray valuation appropriate? And the answer is relations to particular persons and places are a central component of what it is to lead a good human life. And now I'll go, go from, I'll make, introduce yet another philosophical distinction between what I'll call instrumental value, that something's valuable because it's an external causal means to a good human life, and a constituent, what it is, something that is part of a good human life. And you can get this if you think of this idea of friends as social capital. So if I say friendship is necessary for the good life, one way of thinking about it is that friendship is an external means to a good life. That, and that's what friendship as social capital gives you. It's better employment possibilities, higher income and so on. But if, if you only value friends for that, I'm, I'm telling you now, you don't have friends because friends are valued for their own sake. They're valued as ends in themselves. And friendship isn't just some external means to something else, which is called a good life. It's part of what makes a good life. So we value friends de re. And, you know, when a friend dies, there's no compensation for that loss. I think that's true also of attachments to particular places. Right. And it's true of ordinary everyday places people inhabit, inhabit and their attachments to particulars. And their loss has no compensation. And that and I'll give you here an example of what I used often before is uh, the Namada Dam in India. And that was going to be flooded out, right? And the people there were asked to say, we can take compensation. And they say this is you should tell, tell us to take compensation. What is the state compensating us for? For our land, for our fields, for the trees along our fields. We don't we don't live only by this. Are you going to compensate us for our forest or are you going to compensate us for our great river, for her fish, her water, the vegetables that grow along her banks, for the joy of living beside her? What is the price of this? How are you compensating us for our fields either? We didn't buy this land. Our forefathers cleared it and settled here. What price this land? Our gods, the support of those who are our kin, what price do you have on these? Our Adivasi life, what price? And the point here is that there's no price that can be put on those kinds of goods. But those that loss and that place, there are services there like vegetables, and you could imagine buying vegetables somewhere else. But what matters to that community and the social relations that's embodied in that community is a particular place that is being lost, and there is no compensation for that loss. And that takes me to my final point, and I'm hope I'm not taking too long here, is about bird biodiversity offsetting and the kind of injustices that can be involved. So biodiversity offsetting and net gain policies are aggregative. It's the total levels of biodiversity to be, be maintained or, proved, or, or improved. And off, offset markets achieve this by shifting sites for biodiversity. And that raises issues of justice at two different places, the site where the biodiversity loss takes place and the site where the compensatory gain is, is, is supposed to take place. And injustice occurs at both sites. So I'll say a little bit about birth, both. So it's no compensation to a community who loses a site of biodiversity that matters, that another site elsewhere has seen a gain of biodiversity. And that's true of ordinary urban and rural landscapes that matter to people, and I can talk about those later. But it's most clearly evident in cases where a community loses livelihood and a way of life through a development. So if you take the Compensatory Afforestation Fund Act in India, it's a large biodiversity offsetting uh, mechanism where mining companies that come in and destroy forests pay into a fund and there's forestation somewhere else. Right. So it's so there's a so we've got exactly a biodiversity offsetting. But as someone who woman who is losing a rights to the use of a forest says, what? What do you do when your home and resources are both taken away? We've lost our way of life. It's no compensation for that person to know that there's a great there's a great biodiversity offset elsewhere. But even when you go to where the, the biodiversity offsite takes place, what you see there is also problems of injustice. And there's notable injustice where the burdens are shifted from developers to marginal communities excluded from offset land. So I'll finish with an example here which also shows the problem about this uh, perverse asset class I talked about at the beginning, which is Rio Tinto's uh, Il Ilmenite mine. 
in the region of Madagascar. That's going to cause a loss of littoral forest habitat. But working with the Union of Conservation of Nature and BirdLife International and a series of other NGOs, Rio Tinto Zinc, this big corporation, promises that the mine will have a net positive impact on biodiversity. We're going to have net gain. And it promises, and it says, how are you going to do that? Through offsets to reduce the background rate of deforestation, they say. And they promised gains of a ratio of uh, forest loss to literal forest loss to mining will be two to one. So there'd be a ratio of gain and four to one of all forest types. And that looks great. And the, the, the whole notion of biodiversity, uh, you know, of net gain sounds great. But then you look at who carries the burden and responsibility. And what actually happened in that case is that a community who relied on the forest for their livelihood, who are a poor community, lost their customary rights for the use of the forest resources on the offset site through an NGO associated with BirdLife International. So the agent who causes the loss is a major corporation, Rio Tinto, who is basically shifting the burdens and responsibilities for sustaining forests to those who already have marginal livelihoods. And so the additional burdens of falling on those already the worst off affect and affecting the capacity of, to meet basic needs. And you've also seen then that BirdLife International has got has become dependent for some, something that it's proclaiming is a gain on a, a loss. You've got that structural dependence of environmental gains on environmental damage. So I'll, I'll conclude and say I have a different view of what the sources of our environmental problems are from David, and I'm a lot less more pessimistic. I think what we've got is a system of just continuing economic growth, which requires the constant commodity frontiers, which are destroying habitats and places. And if you want to have a, a system of environmental governance consistent with that, then you've got to shift nature around so it fits in with that. And there you've got biodiversity offsetting with no net loss or net gain. But that shift in location shifts burdens and impacts. Where it's most efficient to shift the burdens is to the poor. Enviro environmental losses often can't be compensated and valuing nature and monetary valuation fail to capture how nature matters. So I'll finish there and try and come. I'll stop presenting. Thanks very much. Wow. There's a lot there, um, and the, 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 there's a lot, a lot of new stuff to think about. I and mean, actually, someone's just put a thing out in the chat saying, um, would there be a ge geographical, would it work if there were geographical limits for the gain, i.e. within, say, 50 miles from the loss? Would that make a difference? And I thought no, I'm, maybe you'd like to just have a look at that one now. Yeah, well, can I give you an example? Closer to home, right, yeah. So I've, I've been working with local environmental groups in Manchester who are defending its uh, uh, rye banks fields, who are defending a, a, a site of biodiversity that's really important to them, right? And they're told it's OK because Manchester, pol Manchester has a policy of net gain, right? So in Manchester, we'll create another place somewhere else. So it's nearby. But to that community that's lost that really important site of biodiversity, that doesn't compensate their loss. And that community has developed that site, lived in that site for a long time. And interestingly, I mean, this is where I find issues about green, green space and, and uh, brownfield sites. A lot of the most interesting sites of biodiversity in Manchester are old landfill sites that have been left to nature, which are much more interesting than the big green parks, for example, in terms of biodiversity. And it's and so you have, you know, even in a local area, you've got those losses that are happening across. So, and even in the case of Madagascar, you're talking about forests that's nearby where the loss is happening. So I, don't, I think the geographical location doesn't necessarily solve the problem. Uh, right. Well, that, that, there's going to, that, um, lots of other questions going to come up on that. But no, that is that is brilliant, John, and um, really interesting stuff. Xanthi, um, can you hear me? Um, we'd like to unmute yourself and do the third do the third contribution. Absolutely, thank you, Ellen. Please, could you pop up my presentation? Yes, yeah. Just got to. That's a paper about moths. Mm -hmm. Right. 
just to, to kick start, thank you very much to Curly Action for having me and everyone for joining today. David and John, I really enjoyed your introductions and look forward to continuing the conversation. I am Xanthi and I'm from a company called Green UK, which we set up a year and a half ago to help find support from UK businesses for UK wildlife projects run by charities who are all experts in their various fields. I would like to speak briefly today about the business side of this topic, why businesses support wildlife projects, what are the benefits for society and businesses when they do, and some investment patterns we have noticed. As the Dasgupta Review argues, the world cannot tackle climate change and build long-term economic resilience without protecting and enhancing nature, our most important asset. Next slide, please. So my first question is, what are businesses looking for in connecting with and helping to fund wildlife pro projects? On a practical level, I can tell you what businesses want based on our experience at Green the UK. They want to support projects which are local to where they and their clients work and live. Since COP15, improving biodiversity has become more and more of a reason for many businesses to fund wildlife projects. People notice their local problems and want to help solve them, whether it's a lack of native pollinators when they walk in the park or a dramatic reduction in curly sightings since their own childhood. Often businesses will have their own CSR goals, which incorporate supporting their local communities, which can be achieved through funding and engaging with a wildlife project. The real hook for businesses to work with us is their desire for variety. There is so much to do and there are so many interesting wildlife projects they could support. We've noticed a strong pattern in our return supporters choosing a different project. In year one, they may support a land-based project and in year two, they may choose to support kelp or native oyster restoration. We have other clients who want to support projects across the country, which is possible with our wide network of charity and project partners. Engaging others in the projects they choose to support is another key reason. Whether this is an external or internal drive, businesses want to share what they're doing. Another incentive is educating both adults and children about the wildlife projects so that they will choose to do their bit too, creating a domino effect. Next slide, please. So how does society benefit when business engages with natural history? How do businesses benefit too? The obvious one is that businesses can help remove a key hurdle, which is funding. Often if they have the budget set aside already, they can move quite quickly to support a project. It's an opportunity to improve their knowledge in their local area and become stewards of their environment for years to come. The deeper a business's understanding of the natural world, the more likely they are to make informed decisions about the impacts of their business practices on their natural surroundings. Through engaging their stakeholders and supporting wildlife projects linked to schools, businesses support adults and children to learn about natural history. I think this is hugely beneficial my background is in teaching. I used to be a secondary school teacher and I'm particularly excited for the new Natural History GCSE. Learning about natural history enables pupils to understand the world around them and their impact on it and that of society at large. Fostering a love of the natural world will encourage individuals to make positive choices. Looking ahead, it will provide a new pathway for young people to get into green careers. Outdoors in a different learning environment, we notice new things and learn in different ways. Spending time in natural environments can benefit health and well-being. Businesses who have an extensive reach in their communities can lead by example and empower others to learn about and support wildlife too. Several of our supporters signed up after seeing another business in their local area was already supporting one of our projects. Businesses can help improve access to and knowledge of wildlife. All Green UK school projects are run in partnership with schools with high numbers of pupils eligible for free school meals because we want to make sure everyone has access to nature. Just last week, we were visiting a project and talking to an education officer who mentioned a recent workshop where an 11 year old boy told her that he had never seen a slug before. Next slide, please. 
So is there any evidence of a shift from climate related investment to wildlife related investment? In the last year at Green UK, we have noticed more businesses focused on improving local biodiversity. I'd be lying if I said that businesses aren't motivated by climate change and carbon sequestration. But the word biodiversity has been used considerably more since COP15. Many businesses now have biodiversity as well as climate related goals. I'm no expert on carbon or biodiversity net gain, but I know that we need to encourage businesses to step up and take responsibility for their local wildlife. Biodiversity net gain reporting is available for some of our projects, and I think it's going to become more popular as we work with more big businesses who want to support a wildlife project, but are required to evidence the positive impact of their support. To date, we have found different businesses from different industries sign up to fund wildlife projects for different reasons. As mentioned before, companies can sometimes move a lot faster when they have a budget set aside to support a biodiversity or CSR project. We also see marketing and HR budgets being allocated to wildlife projects. Just as much as those more altruistic reasons, sustainability makes business sense too. People relate to the natural world and want it to be protected. Nature is very emotive and, vi and a visual way to connect with your audiences. Employees want to work for purpose-driven businesses. Investors are looking at ESG when they make their decisions. Sustainable suppliers want to partner with new clients to create solutions together. It's also worth mentioning how popular corporate away days are. We are wary of the benefits for our wildlife project partners because sometimes inexperienced volunteers might not be what they need. We always make sure our volunteering events are contributing to the projects in a positive and productive way. Next slide, please. I've already mentioned some of this, but it's a quick summary of what we do here at Green UK. In a nutshell, we are a middleman between the wildlife experts and businesses. Next slide, please. And here I thought it would be interesting for you to see what our small growing team has achieved so far in partnership with businesses and our project partners. And now I haven't got a slide on this, but I'd like to give you my view on the cost of nature and biodiversity net gain. As I mentioned, I'm not an expert, but if we make it a requirement for certain industries to support wildlife projects, it's both brilliant and a risk. Look at the scrutiny the carbon markets have come under. That doesn't mean to say we shouldn't do anything. Every small action helps, and these conversations help raise the bar and put key issues under scrutiny so that we can do better. We want to enable businesses to support natural restoration at scale. And if BNG opens the door to support, to more support without doing more damage, then we're on board with it. Some argue that the tool still needs development, as there are some sites where we can make huge improvements for nature, but the BNG would not be high. There is a high value on habitat creation, such as woodland, but not such a high value on restoring other habitats. You don't get extra points for protecting or creating something which is incredibly rare. It takes hundreds of years to see the results of new habitat in comparison to existing planting. Can we put a value on nature? John's joke explained this really well. If we put a value on nature, we could justify destroying some habitat to create it elsewhere. What they have destroyed could be a unique habitat. For example, the horried ground weaver, a type of money spider, globally is only known to exist on a couple of sites in Plymouth. Can we compensate destroying its habitat? Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Sandy, and that's uh, that's a really nice um, point to end on. Um, well, I, just before I ask Sandy the question, um, Let's have some more questions coming up in the chat. There's a few coming up, but they really fuel the back end of this discussion, which is great. Otherwise, you, you, know, you get me and that's not nearly as good. Um, Xanthi, you, you mentioned one of the things about businesses is that, 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 that their desire for variety. And I wondered if that's necessarily a good thing and where the focus would be better. And is there a danger that businesses end up doing what businesses want rather than what we need them to do because they've got the money? 
very good question. I think if if Variety keeps businesses interested in supporting projects which are run by experts, then um, then Variety is good. I agree that if they are just supporting Variety for the sake of it, then um, then that wouldn't be brilliant. But we do carefully pick our partners at Green the UK to make sure that that we are supporting species that will help whole habitats, not just one unusual species. Um, right, that, that's, I mean, those are three fantastic presentations and you, you, you've all gone above and beyond and thank you because it's a, certainly for me as a novice, it's a, it, it, it's, it's a new, I'm, I'm struck by the infancy of this whole debate and that one of the great things is we're discussing it whilst it can all change. But John, can I just kick off by saying to you, David needs his 5.2 billion. Where's he going to get it from? You're, you're on mute. <laughs> I haven't got an answer to David's question, right? Yeah, so, so I, I, who I work with much more is environmental justice organisations. Right, who are, are on the receiving end of it, of the, of the problem rather than the other side, and it and it comes down to where you think the real problems of biodiversity loss come from. Right, is it simply as a, a lack of finance? If it's a lack, is it simply a lack of finance? Then that's a really important question. If you think it's because we've basically got at the present, I mean, you had Liz Truss spouting it the other day. We want growth, 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 growth. Right. And we, <laughs> it, if you think that's the economic model, then you're going to end up with biodiversity loss. And that's going to go on regardless of shifting around bits of nature from one place to the other to, to do it, to do it. So so what so what I, so my, my view is, is that we've really got to think about what the implications of having a policy of responding to environmental damage by thinking, okay, it's okay, we can use, we can get money which creates something somewhere else, and making nature shift so that the economic growth juggernaut can carry on. And that's and I see that with development. And people say development's going to happen anyway. I'm mostly working with people who are trying to stop development happening in certain places. And I think that's where you need to, that's what you need to start thinking about. You need to start thinking from that end rather than thinking where do we get cash for X, Y, and Z. And, and what worries me is once you start focusing on that, and I can see it with an organization like the one I'm talking to, it's very tempting because it's a source of income. But what I'm trying to say is where you get in your income from is once you've got an offsetting regime is from environmental damage and that environmental damage is happening somewhere else and, and, and i think what i'm getting what i'm getting john is that you're saying that, that forest um that dam that greenfield site we just have to fight harder at the beginning i'm yeah. not so okay so um david um i could see i was watching your expression on the perverse asset class slide um and just wondered what what you thought about that and whether you wanted to um, have a view on that. Well, yeah, can I just say one thing before that? I mean, <clears throat> I would absolutely die to love to live in a world that John's explained. Zero development. You know, I would, as long as I was probably strong enough, I wouldn't mind living in some part of the Neolithic period, which is where we probably fix, because... He's right. You know, it is a it is a bit of a juggernaut, but we've got eight billion people on the planet. You know, if we had one billion people on the planet, we might be in a much, much better situation. And um, and, you know, development to me is anathema. I, I, I actually despair of development. And I, I worked with a lot of developers, as I said early on, and I can guarantee one thing that um, we don't live in a world that's full of environmental conservationists that understand and love nature we are a minority whether we like it or not and that might grow and the fantastic work that Xanthi explained there was superb and getting into schools is really critically important but out there at the moment even with cost of living rise and we've had pandemic cost of living recession we've got climate change and then biodiversity loss um you can we can only get the message through to the general public 
if we get it on um, if we if we get them to understand the economic impacts that are coming down the track that's the whole point um and i i think that you know we can pontificate as much as and philosophize as much as we want about um uh, about the the wrongs of development but development is there it's happening we all depend on it and this issue around growth yes it depends on whether it's one, two, three percent growth. Do, do we manage for negative growth? That would absolutely politically never get off the blocks. And we can just forget that because we would never get the support of the general public at all. So what my take on this is that you, we've got to capture that economic impact and that value, get people to understand that if we don't actually restore nature, it's going to get very, very bad. Um, and the sorts of people that Xanthi's talking to on the corporate side, it, you know, they are they are absolutely just at the cusp of understanding the impacts of biodiversity loss on their business models. And so I think that their, you know, their marketing budget, the HR budget and the CSR budget is going to actually morph into a mainstream investment from those corporates to prevent them from becoming the laggards falling behind not getting the investment they need themselves, as, as Anthony said. So that's where that's where the success factors lie. So just just remind me what your question was, Roger, again. <laughs> well, the the, 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 um, the question was um, wh whether you had a view on this sort of perverse asset class, but I think you've answered it actually. I, I, don't, um, I mean, it, I don't think if, if it, there's no asset class in the world that's perverse if someone's prepared to pay for it. That's the point, and. Um, and, you know, just take you back to what we've done in the Environment Bank. Who could have imagined three years ago where a, a large sustainable investment private equity investor thinks that biodiversity is so important because it generates a revenue stream that they'd invest 220 million in? That it, You know, that's, that's more than half of the annual spend on agri-environment payments from government. Uh, and, you know, we know the basic payment scheme is going to be phased out by 2027, leaving farming in a mess, whether we, we we agree with subsidies into farming, I personally don't. I think where you subsidise any activity like that, it doesn't really generate value. And I think it's, it's there is a perverse impact that that has caused. And so, um, you know, better understanding of how markets can work with the farming and landowning sector to generate biodiversity, looking at regenerative agricultural practices, those sorts of things at scale. So although development is probably impacts on around 10,000 hectares a year in the UK, um, it's still a lot of land, but it's not massive. And farming, um, you know, is used, 70% of the land is farmed. The biggest banks for bucks are going to be in how we transition farming in the future. And that's where I think certainly with curlew as an icon species, that is something of real interest. But the curlew, you know, if someone's prepared to pay for curlew, uh, it is an asset, and that's good in my my world. I think that um, you know, let's look back at before all of the ESG, the biodiversity credits, the if you like the offsetting. Although that you know, I I sort of temper my views ar around that. We were not spending anything like the amount of money on biodiversity conservation. The, na the nature conservation agencies, Natural England, Environment Agency, have con continued to have withering funding uh, uh, through time, slight uptick in the last couple of years, but nothing of any significance that will really change the dial on biodiversity. So private investment into private land holding and land held by others is, is definitely the thing. And, you, and we will have to create asset classes that enable that investment to take place. Um, that, um, uh, there's a very busy pad and pencil sitting in the Manchester area. So, John, if I can ask, ask you to come back on that one br reasonably briefly, because I don't want to move uh, on. To well, I'll, 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 be very, I'll be very brief. I mean, the first thing is I, I, I never said that I was a great, against all development. I'm, I'm against having a machine that just you have to keep growing because that's how you survive in a competitive market. Some development meets human needs, and, I, and I've got no problems with that. A new, a new motorway service station on a motorway that destroys a woodland doesn't. And the fact that, that you're going to say, oh, there's a piece of woodland that you can produce next door as an offset doesn't respond to that. The, on the perverse asset point, what I was trying to point out was what's happening, for example, in Madagascar, which is that you start getting a structural dependence of nature conservation organisations on environmentally destructive businesses. And that seems to me to is a perverse asset and what you're getting is precisely 
environmental gains being dependent on environmental losses right but anyway well other people I, oh, I, can i just say roger i totally agree with that i mean i think if you've got situations where ngos are dependent on damaging operations that's a really crummy way of operating it, that should not be happening and that's why you know for example the wildlife trusts and the rspb etc cetera, etc cetera, shouldn't be getting involved in the biodiversity offset or the biodiversity net gain markets because they you know their members might not be desperately keen on that but if it that development is going to if that development is going to happen in it and there has not been a way of stopping that development and i've seen this so many times you know you wouldn't believe the the the, the level of work that has to be done to go to take a developer through the planning system and then that you end up with something that you think you've designed which is really good for biodiversity or at least it's going to protect that biodiversity then they go back with a variation to a permission and the planning authorities say yes okay that's what's happening out there in the wide world and and, and that's why the biodiversity net gain model takes the liability from the developer because they never will deliver it and it puts it into those on the farmers, landowners and conservation bodies that can deliver it. So it's that shift of finance, which is really critical um, and, and the liability. Um, I've just, just, I've, I've just, very, just a very brief response to that. I mean, one thing I, well, I meant to add before was when you get, I mean, sometimes a development has to take place and it meets human needs. And I, and I understand that. What I think is false is to say that there's no loss. There's some losses that can't be compensated for. So okay. to present it as no net as a net gain and to to ignore the real existence of losses has to be understood. And, and I think that point's been very very well made and actually sort of by everyone. Actually, the interesting thing came up in the chat, which I'll read. There's a value in all your points of view. I love things that start like that. <laughs> I think a multi-pronged approach, which incorporates all of these points of view, could support each other as opposed to one strategy or the other. Philosophically, John, I agree with you. The master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. I think we certainly need to develop a rights-based approach to nature further. That said, we are so enmeshed in the capitalist system, I think we almost have no choice right now but to work within this system. Um, Xanthi, there was quite an interesting one that came up, just uh, um, shedding a bit more light on what you've been talking about. Uh, is there a particular sector interested in investing in nature restoration projects, a particular sort of sector of business that you've identified? We work with businesses of all sizes from a range of industries. We've definitely had certain spaces that have supported more projects. And I think that may be largely due to word of mouth because we've only been going for 18 months. Um, we have a strong um, set of support coming from estate agents and their interest is is actually a little bit different to what you expect it might be some of our tree planting is actually to help the uk timber industry so we import 80 percent of our around 80 percent of our timber from overseas so some of our our projects will go, will go into uk timber tree planting projects and estate agents like the idea of supporting tree planting which will in turn maybe go back into their homes so we do have other tree planting projects that are good for biodiversity or um, uh, replanting post-storm damage and and planting to improve resilience to climate change pests and diseases but um the the timber angle was was really attractive for estate agents so um it's a different hook for everyone really okay that, um that, that an injury i guess this is another question that's come up on the thread which is probably you no know, um for dave and xanthi would, uh, would you take money from someone like ineos for your curly project uh, um which i guess raises the wider thing of is where the limitations are as to who the money comes from david do you want to kick off with that one Well, we, we would, we're not doing anything particularly on curlew as a single species because the BNG is, is essentially habitat based. And if you do it at scale. Sorry, I, I, I meant more, more widely, just generally. But more widely. Um, well, you, you, as long as it's a huge amount of money and it's actually relating to uh, something you can really do good with, um, because otherwise, yeah, I mean, you've, 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 you've got to do that. You've got to, you've got to basically do that. Um, uh, but you have to make sure that 
they understand why they're doing it. I wouldn't be very keen on just them giving you a chunk of money to make them feel good if they haven't actually looked at what their own environmental impacts are. And so I'm very, very much against offsets um, in the general sense that you've got to, you can only do residual offsetting. You cannot do offsetting and then carry on business as usual. So one would need to know what the sort of Any often could you actually convert that into something that could be useful for curly populations? I think that's a really interesting um, view about not just being interested in their money, but interested in sort of um, where that attitude comes from. Xanthi, do you want to add something on that? We want to encourage all businesses to support their local wildlife. If um, we ever have restrictions on on who supports a project that is also very much guided by our charity partners so they will all say that they are happy to take support from whoever the business is um so we work in in that collaborative way but i would uh, I, I would never want to kind of police who the support is coming from but i would agree with with david that if if it's offsetting um, practices that that we don't agree with, then then we definitely have to consider that. And, and in a shameless plug for Curlew Action, if there is a main board director of INEOS or anyone else out there, um, Curlew Action is always very pleased to talk to anyone um, because um, these things cost money. Um, Ellen, um, you've been you've had more time to study the um, the thread than I have. Um, what would you like us to talk about next? I have, yeah, I've been looking through. I mean, a lot of them, it's some really good sort of like comments and people adding adding thoughts. I think one of the questions that I thought was really interesting and particularly relevant to curlews was, I've now got to find it again, um, was from Matthew. And he is he raises a concern about preserving the culture of farming in the areas that curly breed. And I know that um, talking about farm payments is something that's quite big in curly conservation. I know Xanthi and I have talked about it in how can we protect curlews? Can we maybe pay farmers to delay silage cutting, something like that? But I guess this question is probably more for John because it, it kind of brings in the the cultural stuff. How do we balance that that cultural side of farming that we can't pay for with the economics? I don't know if I phrased that very well, but do you understand what I'm getting at? Yeah, I, I do. Under, I do understand what you're getting at. And, and what's interesting, I mean, I had difference with him, but J, uh, James Raybank's book on the pastoral, I thought was a really interesting book. But what it picks up is just the economic pressures farmers have been under for a long time to intensify farming and the damage that that's done. And And again, I think you're looking at the wrong end of things if you think, OK, how do we offset that going on. I think what we have to do is look at why we got into the situation, partly through you know the, the you know the kind of pressures that he talks about, where you've got companies coming along, the the, the the very competitive global markets you're working in, and so forth, where the only way that farmers seemed to be able to survive was by destroying their old a, a culture that existed, and ha and and engaging in farming practices which destroyed the, that that habitat. So. Again, I think you need to look at the front the front end of it rather than the back end of thinking about how you offset it, right? So, and and what you what you lost was a culture of farming. So, if I go back to my my dad working, you know, I mean, there was bad things about that culture. I'll say that straight straight away. I mean, going up in a hiring fair and having farmers working around you and saying you're worth eight pounds or ten pounds, right? he felt was humiliating and it was humiliating right yeah and that's a price of a person right never mind the price of a uh, of a farming but what he did see when he was farming there was uh, you know and he was farming practices that were com compatible with the curly right and that's why you know the song of the call of the curly was so important to him and that that kind of farming culture got destroyed by a certain kind of Large, treating farms as large businesses that had to maximise their profits to survive. And I think that's the driver. Um, thank you, John. David, have you got anything on that? Um, yes, I mean, I think, you know, if you look at the Upland Hill farming, the, the, the whole farming model is completely barking mad. Um, you know, you see you see sheep farmers with 300 sheep 
and they think they can and work's been done on this particularly in areas like Wensdale, Wharfdale they think um, well we're not making any money out of 300 sheep I need more sheep that I can then sell at a profit so then your vet med costs your fighting elevation climate um, etc by having input costs so your input costs go through the roof then they seriously get into the red and the only way many of them uh, are surviving at the moment is through um, their spouse's income to around about an average of about 27k a year so they, they it's, it's extraordinary if you look at the different statistics on what farmers make as an income it's it's, it's bizarre you know it's so low um, and so then you've got to look at where the supermarkets place take a place in this and you know looking through the supply chain should the supermarkets be paying for impacts that the farmers are having to do um or do we have to put food prices up and we know how politically um sensitive that will be uh, so I, you know it's a it's a it's a very complex story but certainly food is too cheap as it's done at the moment that's one factor um but going to reg- as i say going to region agriculture at scale i think really offers a lot of value and it will enable us to get back to more cultural methods of growing culturally based methods of growing food um, rather than you know humongous machine can I just add one thing I went to see a vertical farm in two weeks ago and although I didn't really wasn't particularly enamored by the the scale and size of the shed that I looked at a four a four acre in old money um, vertical farm creates the same amount of food as a thousand acres so we were talking to the vertical farm saying that 996 acres that's left over, we could do something really good for that for biodiversity. And there's a massive tip there, potentially. So, you know, lots of new agri- innovation in agriculture, I think, is the way forward to actually enable us to do land sharing as well as a bit of land sparing. But land sharing, in my view, is, is going to be the way forwards in the future. And I think to underline the importance of you, you've all said in one way or another, the importance of um, the way we eat and the way our food is produced and the contribution that makes to biodiversity loss is absolutely huge. I mean, I think 50 percent of of, um, biodiversity loss is loss of habitat and 80 percent of that is down to farming. So I think all this debate has to continually refer back into farming. Otherwise, it. um, isn't worth it. Um, Xanthi, do you want to add anything to that one? And um, you don't have to. Um, can I jump out the box and ask David a question? Um, I, David, I was just thinking about biodiversity net gain and and all of your projects. And I, as, if I'm correct, those are all based in England. What do you think the solution is for other countries in the UK? Well. We're really keen to work in Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland. Um, the problem is that in Wales, they've, I think, adopted a very different model that doesn't have a metric. Um, and it's it's basically very qualitative. Effectively, it's the same old, same old, same old as we've been doing in England for years, which doesn't work. So I'm really concerned about that because they, they need to reevaluate that. Scotland's a bit more... Um, on message in terms of net gain. And I think that will, you know, I think they will bring in something if they haven't already. I'm not I'm not up to it over the last few weeks, but they are talking about um, having a similar model. The only problem, and it is a real frustration, is well, if, ever, if, if, if England comes out with something called biodiversity net gain, in Wales and Scotland, and not necessarily Northern Ireland, but they have to call it something different. And, and it just, it's really confusing. And so what, what the underlying point is that if you, don't have a standard and a metric that sets the standard. So if you had sort of, if you can imagine you had 15 different types of gold from rubbish gold to really fantastic gold, the price of gold would actually probably collapse because no one could actually see where it all fits. And so, you know, we've got to have a standard and that's why the metric's really important. So my message would be for any country that wants to do it, get a really robust, as robust as possible standard uh, and use that as as the metric that generates the currency that people will invest in. Um, right, th- thank you. And there's, there's some there's some cracking questions coming up on the th- um, thing. Um, uh, Ellen, we've got uh, we've got room probably for two more. So if you choose it and direct it at the first first person you want to answer it. Yeah, um, I've got one that's specifically for for Xanthi, um, from Julian about can you give the range of money the businesses is supporting conservation projects and what is the biggest challenging to pairing businesses with a project 
both very good questions. So it ranges massively. We work with some one-man SMEs up to companies with thousands of employees. Uh, so we would have commitments from one grand to 100K per annum. Um, and the challenges are when the priorities of a business and the priorities of our charity and project partners don't necessarily align. So if a business really wants to have 100 people out at a volunteering event next week but we actually say next week is, is not planting season or whatever it might be or they want um, certain metrics so we have a lot of businesses coming to us saying oh we want to offset by planting trees and we don't do that we um, can do tree planting but it's um, for lots of other reasons which I, I've already explained to you so it, it's it's often trying to re-educate if, um, or kind of tell businesses about the projects that we do have. If we have somebody with a big budget who wants to do something that we don't already have on our books, then we will go out there and try and find the right partner for that. So every conversation is slightly different if that answers Julian's question. And um, Ellen, one more. Yeah, so I've got one um, from Claire from early on. So she says, is there a risk that we widen the wealth gap by rewarding landowners, that we increase the inequality of access to quality green space and fail to address the underlying issue that the general public should love nature and possibly would, what's my place, and possibly would if we were to more closely connect, not read that properly, or does the natural capital approach have ways to address these? Sorry. Yeah, John, you, you can't yeah, yeah, can I come in? I mean, it's partly just to, uh, to agree with what's behind the question. So, I mean, working in Manchester, I work with a lot of groups looking at urban sites for biodiversity. And, and, that, and they're, they're, what you have there is people uh, in contact with biodiversity close, you know, within within the urban limits. And they're people that often that couldn't get to out to places, far, you know, to exotic places far away. And it's their contact with nature. And when someone comes along and says, it's OK, you losing that because it will be gained somewhere else, that is a loss to that community. And again, it's often a place where, I mean, and it was strange, as I said before, I mean, talk to Ted Benton about this as well, where some of the sites of biodiversity are in urban areas. They're often in, as I said before, old landfill sites. They're in, and they can be in quite, you know, quite close to working class areas where people get contact with nature in a very direct way. And, and what worries me about the idea that we can offset it and offset it somewhere else is the loss of nature that people experience every day. So, and, and, that, and some of those don't come out very high on biodiversity scores. I mean, they, 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 but, they, they, but some of them do. Right, yeah, and I think it's important we understand the value of those kinds of places close to people who otherwise wouldn't have that experience of nature. Um, Dave, David, quick answer to that one. Yeah, I mean, I think you you need both basically because it's not an either or situation. And I think that's the trap that we fall into um, that we think, well, we're sacrificing it within an urban area, putting it out into the sticks. And um, uh, and I'd, I'd sort of probably add one thing that I've always been faced with, not not so much more recently, but in the past where people have said, oh, we don't like what you're doing because you're making money out of the environment. Um, well, we, 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 put, we haven't been making that much money yet, but we hope we might do it at some point in time. But, you know, the 220 million is a, is a major first. If we were a not for profit, the investors would not have been interested in it at all. So that money would not have come into the natural environment sector. And that goes directly into landowners, farmers, tenant farmers, um, and landholders. Uh, uh, and 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 I've you know I often say, well, just because you think developers can make a profit out of land, and farmers are supposedly supposed to make a profit out of growing food, whether well, that's a bit debatable as to how much they make, and that others, you know, infrastructure is there and it makes a profit in some shape or form out of using that land. Why why do we think that nature restoration shouldn't make a profit? That's the basic, that is the basic problem. Uh, and you that's why we haven't had the investment into nature restoration is because it's seen as a, it's seen as a value of zero. 
That's the whole point at the moment. And what we're trying to do is to say, no, it has real value and it is X. And therefore, which is what we've done in the Environment Bank, we've managed to, to get this big funding. And it's the first of a few tranches of a similar amount over the next three to four years that we hope we'll get. Well, um, and, and I know John would like to come back and I'm not going to let him on that one because we're running out of time. Um, what I, 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 um, there's a question about bristle thighed curlews, which I, I'm longing to throw in there, but it's actually not probably um, what we can cover. Um, I was just as my last thing, knowing you've got a few minutes left, um, I was very moved by John's comment about what, what got him into the curlew, because people's stories of how this bird and other birds first got into their heart is a really strong one. I think his narratives are very, very, very strong. So I just would like to throw out to David and then Xanthi, how did you just get into this? How, what was your first connection with the curlew? David. You go first. You go first, Xanthi. Okay, Xanthi. I'm going to be completely honest. I have never heard a curly. So I'm I'm a southerner and um, or a Londoner, and I um, very sadly have have never heard of curlew. But I, I remember speaking to one potential client up north, and they had had a similar story um, about their childhood, and hadn't ever kind of sat down and thought about how they hadn't seen curly since their childhood and on the call with me suddenly realized how um they hadn't seen um curlies in their local area for decades and it's when you have moments like that 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 you know that you, you've got someone that is hopefully going to support a project for the right reasons Right, we will um, we will rectify. We at Curlew Action will rectify your haven't heard a curly <laughs> thing within the next week. Um, you'll be getting a call tomorrow. Um, and um, David, well, I was, I was going to invite Xanthi up here. You're welcome any time up into North Yorkshire, <laughs> and I can show you lots of curly uh, singing at the moment. They arrived here on the sixth of February, disappeared for a bit, and they usually come back on the eighteenth of February to the day. How that works, I do not know, but it's amazing. Um, I, at the age of five, I got interested through my father in terms of, you know, going out into the countryside and looking at birds. And I just got hooked, really, um, probably a bit nerdy at that age. But then I spent all my time just dr drawing and then later on photographing birds um, and uh, and Curly were one of it. And of course, Xanthi, you, you're too young to remember, but actually you would have been seeing, seeing Curlies in the 60s and 70s around uh, where you are. And they have just... Um, disappeared from vast swathes of Britain uh, and in Yorkshire we've still got a, a reasonable population so I got involved at a really young age um, and did ecology as a degree and then a PhD in population dynamics of birds and then so that's why I still doing what I'm still doing um, and we might actually win the day at, at some point in the future I'm hopeful. <laughs> um, that that is, um, look, that's great. And I'm not going to insult this discussion by trying to summarise it, because I think all that happens is you contort it into when you have a um, the, the differing panellists we've got. I, I simply couldn't do that. I, I know a lot more and I want to learn a lot more as a result of this discussion. Um, and before I sort of let you all go, um, my colleague Mary has said, why don't you ask them all just to put a value on a curlew? So, starting with Xanthi. I couldn't. You couldn't. <laughs> okay, that's fine. John, you're muted. Unmute. We want to hear what you're saying. What we haven't talked about is contingent valuation at all, because I've been talking about... Uh, and I, um, my view is, is precisely what you get from... If I'd asked my dad what's the economic value of a curly, he'd think I was an idiot, right? <laughs> yeah. And he would protest, and and that's what I would do as well. I would protest and say it's the wrong kind. It's a it's a bit, yeah, it's the wrong kind of measure. It, you can't capture the value of something. In a, it's a bit. It's a bit like, uh, yeah, it's they're they're priceless. Exactly, someone's come through. It's a bit like saying how much is your mum worth? 
Or I'll <laughs> meaning to or me or me turning around to my my partner and say, I love you so much, it would take about twenty thousand pounds to leave you. And then her complaining and me saying, no, no, sorry, 30, 40,000, 50,000, right? Yeah, it's the wrong <laughs> well, question. That's a great answer, David. I, I suspect you're going to say the same well, thing. Well, I, 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 yeah, I think they're pri absolutely pri priceless. Um, but I could probably value, I could put a valuation on the habitat you'd need to create to actually encourage them. And if you started at 100 hectares, that's going to cost you probably around 600,000 pounds to keep it for 30 years without giving any secrets away. Not cheap, but you know what? What is the alternative? Well, um, guys, thank you so much for um, really a, a, a fascinating. Once you get a philosopher in, you know, just it's, it's the whole thing is, is a fascinating conversation, and we could go on for hours, and we probably should, but we always try and finish these by eight o'clock sharp. And thank you so much for um, joining us, and thank you to. We've had a great audience tonight. You took some time to get going on the on the chat, but you've you've nailed it now. Um, this will be um, available on YouTube probably by tomorrow. Uh, if any of your friends want to see it, um, can I just say thank you to everyone? And our next one, Ellen, is when, and we're going to talk about silage. Yes, and you've put me on the spot here. And I before have. the webinar, I think it's I was like, I I think something this. like March the sixth, March the fifteenth or sixteenth. It's 15th the nearest, of March, silent. Right. Yeah. Um, and um, and that's bound to get there. Um, everyone, um, go well, have a great evening, and thank you so much for joining us. Bye-bye. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Good thank to you. see you all. Bye-bye now. Bye. -bye. Bye.